Hello everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to paint short black fur in acrylics. So what I do to start with for something like this is I like to start with a mid-tone grey as a base layer. I don't like working against the white, a lot of that's going to be down to personal preference but I do certainly find that I'm able to judge my values and my colours a lot more accurately when I'm not working against the white. So because this is black fur I chose to use a grey base layer but if I was painting a tiger I might go with more of a burnt umber, burnt sienna type base layer. I then used transfer paper to get my outline on my canvas board. Now that is my preference when I'm working on any kind of canvas, any surface like this with acrylics because the surfaces I find don't erase very well. So if you do still like doing your freehand and you don't want to use the tracing and transfer method, what I like to do is freehand that sketch on a separate bit of plain printer paper and then tape that at the top two corners so that you know it's in the right place and then use your transfer paper to get that outline on your canvas. That will mean that you're not going to risk damaging that canvas from erasing your sketch lines. If we do make a slight mistake we need to be able to fix that and it just means it keeps the surface nice and clean. So here at times, as you saw with those paint colours that I was showing, my hand here, the paint brushes that are, are in view here, is where I'm explaining what I'm doing because this is available on Patreon as a real-time tutorial, it's just over two hours long. So if that is of interest, I'll link that in the description below. So although this was a Patreon tutorial focusing on the black fur, I did want to incorporate the eye in it as well, obviously being that that is a very important part of the reference photo. So just like with any painting, I pay really close attention to the highlights of the eye, where the shadow is, the shape of the eye, and then I focus on the colour of the iris after. So I'm going in with close, I've got that nice yellow ochre burnt sienna base layer, but I'm not really focusing on making sure that I get the colour 100% exact. What I'm focusing on here is that I've got that 3D effect of the eye correct. So I've got that shadow, the highlight, the colour where it starts to get darker at the bottom lid and lighter as it gets closer to the pupil. Obviously the lighting is going to vary depending on that reference photo but most of the time all eyes are going to have that shadow on the outer edges especially in some cases on the top edge before you get to the reflection and then the, the sort of the sphere effect of that eye will all come together once you've got your shadows in place. The highlights making sure you've got them as bright as they need to be and if there are any very subtle highlights over the iris area itself that is another thing to make sure that we capture those very tiny details will help to make that eye look that much more reflective which is obviously what we want to be capturing in our paintings. These tiny little highlights that I'm working on here this is a prime example. We don't necessarily want all highlights in the eye to be bright white. Some of them are going to have more of that translucent effect. So we want to make sure that we are varying the thickness of that paint that we're using and not always using pure white. One thing as well that's going to affect how much detail you can capture within that eye is how large you are painting. So this was about a 4 by 6 so it was a nice size for a study but I had to be realistic with how much detail I could add. So at the moment here I'm starting to add some of the reflections from the eyelashes at the top that can be captured in this top bright highlight. If I was working smaller than this I may not be able to get details like this in place so it's really important to be realistic with how much detail we can fit in with the scale that we're working on. Now that being said if you are working smaller and the eye is considerably smaller than what I've got here you can still indicate at that light source with your shadows and your highlights and the eye will still look realistic. So that's the main thing that I like to focus on and then the colour I can sort of tweak as I go. I don't have to get that 100% at that initial stage but the reflection, the shape of the eye and the shadows, especially the dark eyelid area are the main three areas that I focus on right from the very beginning. And once I got the eye in I then started mapping in my base layers. Now for this I do like to work from dark to light. There are some instances where I will use the opposite method and do light to dark. However most of the time with acrylics, especially for black fur, Dark to light I find is the easiest and most effective way of capturing the realism. I want to do some wet on wet blending where I can. For me personally when I like to use acrylics I like to try and get that nice soft transition between my shadows and my highlights. I think that that's the best way of capturing this shine effect in the, the fur like what I'm trying to create at the moment. I don't want there to be too many harsh edges. 
When you are working on the glossier type of fur like this, it almost looks like a gradual transition from, let's say the, the top of the eye where you've got that eye socket, you've got a nice dark patch and then a narrower highlight into a slightly darker shadow. There are no harsh lines there. Although you can see there are those darker patches, it isn't a solid line. So I do want to make sure that I've got nice soft edges, just like what I'm working on here, to add those mid-tone transition colours, and then I can start to add my details on top. Now, regardless of the medium that I'm working in, I pay really close attention to my base layers. I think they're really important, and that is certainly the same for acrylics. You can see now that I'm starting to refine my base layer. So I'm now adding an extra layer, but I'm still not focusing on any kind of detail. I find that with the base layer in place, it's very easy to then rush into your details. The problem with working that way is you won't have the same depth within the fur. If you're only working with two to three layers, you're not gonna have as much realism with that fur. We need to be adding numerous layers, six, seven, eight layers, sometimes more in some cases, depending on the fur texture. And as you saw then from the few brushes that I was just explaining in that view, the brushes that you use will also create that different fur texture. So we need to be experimenting a little bit there with which brush we like to replicate that in that reference photo. So for me, I like to add as much detail as I possibly can. So I don't necessarily like working with larger brushes. That does fall down with personal preference as well, because for my base layers, I don't like to use overly large brushes even at that stage. Now the reason for that is I find that if you're working with larger brushes for your base layer, we have a tendency to rush that process and put that same colour in a larger area. Whereas I like to really study that photo and see where my highlights and shadows are and try and get that accurate at that stage. So by working with slightly smaller brushes, it enables me to be a lot more precise at my base layer stage. And I find for me personally, I then work a lot more effectively with the additional layers that I put on top. Now, something else that you'll know if you've seen many of the videos that I've got here on YouTube, that I like to work in smaller areas. So although I did the whole base layer of the face area alone, I haven't touched the ear yet, but I did do the base layers all in one stage. I've then sort of almost split that in half and then I'm working on my smaller areas when it comes to my details. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the right way to do it, but for me, I do find I'm a lot more efficient and I get my paintings done that much quicker. It's only because I find by breaking it down into small areas, I don't spend so much time staring at my reference photo thinking, what bit should I paint next? It can be quite daunting if we take on too much of that painting in one go. So if you do find that, the biggest thing that can really help is to just narrow down that area that you're working on, work on a slightly smaller area and tackle each bit individually. And I haven't got the area finished. It's about 60, 70% complete. I can then move on to the area next to it. Once that area is in, you can then work on it and look at that area as a whole and adjust your highlights and your shadows, which is all I'll be doing when I'm working on black fur like this. It really is just a layering process. Throughout this study as well, you'll see that I use different brushes. Now, the reason for that is I like to get as much texture as I can within that fur. Now, this is not texture that you can feel when you run your hand across the painting because it is flat. This is that visual texture. So I don't want all of the fur in the whole study to look the same. Now, something I speak in depth in the Patreon tutorials, but I also cover it here on YouTube, is the fur direction. Now it's really important to make sure that we do get that accurate to that reference photo. For instance, the details that I'm working on now, if I don't curve these paint strokes in the right way, I'm going to completely change the structure of around the eye. Now when we're working on entire pet portraits, if the fur direction is not accurate, that dog will not resemble that reference photo as much as it should and ultimately it won't look like that pet. So it's really important to make sure that the fur direction is accurate. We want to make sure around the eye and on the bottom here where the cheek starts to merge onto the side of the face that we've got that transition between that fur direction from where it starts to slope away. Maybe the fur direction is smoother there so although it's all travelling in the same direction each additional brush stroke curves in a slightly different way. We want to make sure that we are really studying that reference photo closely. Now something else as well that I speak in depth with all of the tutorials is the fur length. Now I think this is one of the areas where it isn't mentioned as much as it should. 
the fur length is going to completely change the look of that dog as much as that fur direction. For instance, the details that I'm working on here, I want to make sure that they are the right length in proportion to the ratio of the size that I'm working on. So if I'm working a much larger scale, I am going to have to lengthen my brush strokes, but I still need to make sure that in that area on the part of the face, for instance, that the brush strokes are still the right length. When you've got a dog such as a German Shepherd, for instance, the fur on the side of the face is going to be a lot shorter than the fur on the chest or maybe the side of the, the area of the face, sort of like the ruffles of fur. So I want to make sure that I've got that variation in the length of each brush stroke. Now a Labrador like what I'm working on here isn't going to have as much variation as a German Shepherd as I say, but it is still going to have some of that slight difference. Look around the eye for instance, that fur there is much shorter and it starts to get longer as we work on the ear and maybe on the top of the head. The brush strokes might only be two or three millimetres longer, but they are longer. So that's sort of indicating at that difference in texture. And something to pay really close attention to on the areas where you are having to lengthen your brush strokes is to make sure that you're still curving them in the correct direction, in the correct way to replicate that part of the face. So if you do take the top section of the eye there, you can see that I am still angling it up towards that middle edge, more towards the left side, but it is still in the middle. I don't want it to go completely over to the left side. That's going to make the face look far too broad so there is a fine line between how much curve we need to get in that brush stroke but we still want to make sure that it's not completely flat so really do study that photo because that is going to completely vary depending on the dog that you're working on more so down to you know even at the same breed so two labradors are not going to be exactly the same the bone structure is going to vary massively depending on each dog so it really does mean that we need to study that reference photo look at it individually and really paint what we see that reference photo has given us all the information needed so try to look at it as abstract shapes rather than individual clumps of fur now something as well that can be really useful is to work upside down so turn your artwork your canvas around turn your reference photo upside down and work on it like that on areas that you're finding particularly challenging the reason being is that your brain will be forced to see those areas as abstract shapes rather than the area around the eye or the ear whatever part of it that might be becoming a little bit challenging and that can certainly be one thing that can help overcome that specific area now the fur here on the ear was very different in that it was almost quite a bit out of focus. So this was in the reference photo, I didn't change any part of this. So what I wanted to make sure is that I kept my brush strokes much softer than the fur on the face and that I did a lot more wet on wet blending. Now with the real time version on Patreon you're able to see how I keep this paint wetter so that I can then add each layer on top and slowly blend those layers together to create this nice soft transition but what I want to do is try and make sure as I say that I keep the layer underneath as wet for as long as I possibly can. One way that you can do that is to get a fine mist sprayer bottle and apply a light layer over the top to help to keep that paint wetter for longer. And my main aim for this is to just indicate at the flow and the direction of that fur, the structure of the ear, whether or not it dips at that shadow in the middle and then curves over. I just want to make sure that I've got my lights and my darks accurate and the rest will follow. Another thing as well, when you're working on out of focus fur, just like on that ear area, is I'm working with much larger brushes. The one way of avoiding to add too much detail is to not use smaller brushes. So work with these larger brushes, these round brushes work really well for that and hold that brush at the end of the barrel if you need to. That will really help to sort of resist that urge to put too much detail in. As you can see here, I'm still indicating at the clumps of the fur, but I'm not using any of my liner brushes at all here, unlike what I did with the face. And it is at this part of the study, you know, where we're getting more towards finishing it, that I take a step back and see what I need to improve in my painting. I then also start to refine my highlights and my shadows, and I do this 90% of the time. Very rarely do I get the entire area completed. I want to make sure that I do step back from my easel and add more of my contrast if needed. Most of the time, as I say, I do find that I need to brighten up my highlights and darken my shadows.
Now one of the common questions with acrylics is why do they look like they fade? Now it's not that they're fading, it's just that they have dried. As soon as you varnish your painting, those colours will come back to looking like they're wet. So they'll have that really good contrast, the colour saturation and the vibrancy will all be put back in. So something that can really be beneficial is in between layers, as long as your painting is completely dry, in between layers you can get a, a larger brush and put a light layer of water across the top. That will help to give the representation of what it's going to look like once it's been varnished. That will help to know whether or not you've got your contrast where it needs to be, your shadows as dark as they need to be and your highlights as bright as they need to be. So I'm just starting to add some very final details here and what I like to do with these studies is I like to put about a two hour time limit on them. I can get a four by six like this done in that time and I'm just able to really show my Patreon members how to tackle these individual fur types. Hopefully then when they get a Black Labrador commission they're going to be able to follow these steps in these tutorials and complete all of their projects from start to finish. They always know that they can contact me anytime. I'm more than happy to answer any of their questions. But as you can see here, it's very much a layering process. All I'm doing for this very final layer is just adding a subtle glaze. I just wanted this to have a little bit more of a purple tint. And you'll see that at the end of the video where I'm gonna upload a finished photograph of the painting. I like to use Liquitex Basics because they are translucent, they work really well for glazes and here is a photo of my finished study. So you can see I've got my shadows really really dark and that's going to help to make that shiny coat appearance that much more realistic. So I really hope this tutorial was of use, if it was I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up because it does help and if you like the content that I upload hit the subscribe and the bell button and I'll be uploading another video here to YouTube next week and as always thank you so much for watching.